Um, I will give a brief outline of what we're going to talk about today. Um, first, I'll give a little background um, about just an overview of this project that the UMass Extension Vegetable Program has been working on for the past winter and then a little, little beyond that. Um, then we're going to talk about um, three case study farms that we worked with this past winter um, working on winter spinach production. Um, with those three farms, we developed an enterprise budget and tracked everything winter spinach related within a tunnel on, on each of the farms. Um, so we'll go through some of that. And then at the end, we'll have some take home messages for potentially increasing profitability of winter spinach um, in New England settings. And also on the call today um, is Danya Teitelbaum of Queens Greens and Ryan Carb of Many Hands, um, which are two of the case study farms. Um, so they are here and graciously offered to um, be available for questions and to offer some insights um, about this project. Feel free to pop questions as they come up into the chat box. Um, and Hannah, who's um, another educator on the vegetable program, will be monitoring the chat box as we go. And I'm realizing as I say that, that I didn't introduce myself. My name is Jambia Piggins. I'm an extension educator with the UMass Vegetable Program. Uh, and here we go. So a little bit of background about this project um, that we're gonna be talking about for the next hour or so. Um, we, the UMass Vegetable Program, got interested in winter spinach production um, uh, because of spinach downy mildew, which is an emerging disease in the region. Um, and we see it pop up in fall and spring field spinach, um, and then also in winter high tunnel spinach. It likes cool weather, um, so we don't really see it in the summertime. Um, and it's a pretty complex pathogen. There's many different races of the pathogen, different strains. Um, there's 19 official numbered races, plus countless other novel strains um, that pop up throughout the world. Um, and uh, they, the disease is primarily managed using resistant varieties. Um, so through our work um, on spinach and mildew, we connected with Jim Carell, who's a researcher at the University of Arkansas. Um, he does a lot of work with the really large scale spinach growers in California and Arizona. Um, and Jim helps us identify the strains of downy mildew that we see in the Northeast. Um, and a few years ago, he came to the Northeast or to Massachusetts um, to see some spinach production out here in the winter because we have these kind of unique winter spinach growing systems in the Northeast that are very different from out in California and Arizona. Um, and Jim was uh, very taken by a, the price that our growers can get for winter spinach, um, and B, the wide range of production systems um, that uh, growers are using and are able to, to produce with. Um, so um, his, his kind of awe <laughs> at all of that um, led us to the next kind of phase of this project, which has these two side-by-side -side goals. One was to increase um, grower awareness in the Northeast of the different kind of techniques that the large scale growers in California and Arizona are using um, to increase their profits. So things like um, seeding really densely and using resistant varieties to combat downy mildew um, and increase mechanization um, with the idea that kind of any step along that line could potentially improve profitability of winter spinach production in the Northeast. Um, and then the other goal that we had was to just gather examples um, of the spectrum of winter spinach production in the Northeast, um, because we do have this unique situation where we have these very low input manual systems to these highly mechanized specialized systems um, and everything in between. Um, so we wanted to, to create some benchmarks for current existing growers and potential new growers um, to kind of compare themselves to and get ideas. So as part, of, um, as part of these goals, we created an enterprise budget, um, which you can see a picture of here. And uh, you should have gotten an Excel sheet with a template of this enterprise budget in your email. I'll send it out again at the end. Um, 
So we created this enterprise budget, which can hopefully be a useful tool on your farm, not only for winter spinach, but for other crops as well. Um, and just a starting point to think about profitability. <clears throat> so with that, we will jump into the farms that we worked with. The first one, we're gonna work kind of from like low input manual to mechanization as, as we talk about these farms. So the first one, um, is many hands and Ryan Carb is on, on the call also um, and can answer some questions at the end. And Ryan, feel free to unmute yourself and if I say something wrong or miss something, jump in, let me know. Um, so uh, many hands markets their spinach primarily through a CSA. They have a, a winter spinach add on to their normal winter share. Um, so for 50 bucks, their CSA customers can get spinach throughout the winter. They grow using organic practices, but they're not certified organic. Um, and through the, the, the price of the, the spinach CSA and with the amount of spinach that they harvested over the season, it came out to about being 641 per pound for spinach, which is definitely much cheaper than some of the other farms that are selling through wholesale and retail accounts, which makes sense given that it's uh, a CSA, it's always, um, cheaper for the consumer. Um, and many hands is definitely on the manual end of the spectrum. Um, most, if not all of, of the tunnel prep um, and harvesting and, and seeding is done by hand or with pretty low level mechanization. Um, so uh, over the summer of 2020, and Ryan, this might be where I get something wrong, so correct me. Um, but over the summer of 2020, the tunnel that we looked at for this case study um, didn't have a summer crop. It was tarped um, over the summer. Um, and then usually in other years, uh, Ryan will form slightly raised beds by or using hand tools. Um, in the fall of 2020, um, just prior to seeding spinach, he, did, he used a walk behind BCS in this tunnel. Um, but then he seeds with a walk behind Planet Junior seeder. Um, and he gets about 80 plants per square foot um, with the density that he's aiming for. Um, and we'll see how that compares to the other two farms that we looked at as we go along. Um, and he seeded on September 21st and was able to get the first harvest um, a few months later, December 3rd. Um, and at least from an outsider's perspective, it was definitely, it was probably big enough to harvest a little before then also. And I think it might've been like a question of when they needed the spinach by, they maybe didn't need it until December 3rd, but they were able to harvest through April 16th, which was about 19 weeks. Um, and, oh, and something I should mention, this asterisk for equipment cost um, doesn't include any tunnel infrastructure costs or irrigation equipment or hand tools. Um, it was mostly like tractor and implement costs, which are the really significant ones. <clears throat> Um, and uh, many hands did have a pretty high labor cost. Most of that labor cost was for harvest labor. Um, they harvest at many hands by hand um, and leaf by leaf. So it's a pretty selective harvesting method. Um, and it does, it take, it's, it's pretty labor intensive. On the flip side of that, um, uh, it does allow you to pick and choose leaves pretty easily. And so it's kind of to sort and get some nice quality spinach. So for example, in this tunnel, there was some pretty, um, there was pretty high levels of winter cutworm feeding damage um, in, in the early fall. Um, but by harvesting leaf by leaf, A, you can kind of harvest around the damaged leaves and, and set those aside. And then B, I think Ryan was able to kill a, a good number of <laughs> caterpillars over the fall. And so the, the caterpillar damage kind of peaked and then as, the tunnel was worked through and the caterpillars were killed, it, it became less of an issue as the season went on. Um, so there's always pluses and minuses. Yes, harvesting leaf by leaf takes a long time, but it also gives you some, um, some sorting ability there. Um, and the last thing I'll say about many hands is that they had very low production material costs. So basically at many hands that included fertilizer and seed, um, and fertilizer is something that Ryan buys in bulk and is used across many summer crops as well. 
Um, so the price per pound is, is pretty small. So they had a production materials cost of about five cents per square foot. And at that point, I will stop talking. If there's any, does anyone have any questions specifically for, for Ryan um, at this point? Pop them, in, pop them in the chat if you do. I know it's always hard to think of questions on cue. <laughs> uh, so we can also continue putting questions in the chat and come back to questions later if that's. What was the production rate for that high tunnel? So we'll talk about um, yield and profit at the end, we'll look at them all side by side. But thanks for bringing that up. Anyone else also feel free to unmute yourself and just ask away. Okay, we'll keep going. Oh, I can unmuted. I, I just I just wanted to add to this is Ryan that uh I also do a lot, of this, so most of the work is just done by me. Um, so it's high labor costs, but it's um, it's also just, I just consider it my profit. Um, so I don't always value my labor <laughs> appropriately um, <laughs> if, I'm not pay, if I'm not paying other people. Totally, that's a good point. And it's always, I know people always say, regardless of whether you do actually value your labor appropriately when you're thinking about it in your own head, when you're looking at the profit of things, it is good to value your own labor, like, and assume that like, okay, if I broke my leg and I couldn't get out there for the whole winter and I had to pay someone to harvest all winter, what would it be costing me? Um, so it is an interesting, at least like a little thought process to go through, but that's a, a good point to make. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Ryan? Anything that I missed or uh, presented? Uh, no, you, you summed it up pretty well. Cool. Oh, Oh, sorry. So this is Lisa. Oh, and there's Hannah speaking up. Yep. I think we're about to say the same thing, which was that there are a couple of questions in the chat. And I'll, I'll let you do that, Hannah. Oh, that's okay. Uh, so can you hear me? I'm trying out a new headset here. Okay, great. Um, so one person is asking about what the finished variety was for the trial. Ryan, I think, did you grow Oroch in the tunnel? Yeah, it was all Oroch. Yep. So the variety is, so a bunch of I think all three of the case study farms agreed to grow this variety of Oroch, um, which was um, a pretty popular variety um, this past winter. Um, so it was Oroch. Okay, great. And then someone else asked um, whether they, they planted 80 plants per square foot, kind of the seeding rate, I think, and then about leaf size. They just say, yeah, they're, they're just curious to know more about leaf size. Ryan, do you want to talk about your at, at what point you harvest and how you choose to? to um, yeah, I think the seeding rate the seeding rate was thirty seeds per foot, um, and the leaf size this uh, that year the spinach grew. I, I, was, I had more reliable irrigation, and the spinach the growth of the spinach kind of surprised me. Um, so the the leaves were 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 rather much larger than I'm used to. Um, like small, like the size of small plates. Um, and uh, yeah, um, normally it's, I'm, I'm usually harvesting more in the baby range, um, but this was, this was pretty full grown spinach. Gotcha. Good. Now something that we'll talk about at the end, um, the, the stage at which you harvest, I think can have a pretty significant effect on your yield. Um, I mean, obviously if you let it get bigger, you have just more yield and if it's something that you have flexibility with with your customers um it could potentially be just an easy way to kind of like bump up your yields it was definitely super lush in that tunnel i remember um yeah being surprised by it also it took off really fast and that's i think oroch is a pretty fast growing variety um that's mm -hmm. kind of marketed to winter tunnels um for that reason yeah and then the other the other nice thing about um harvesting by hand is that I'm leaving what would be perfectly harvestable leaves behind, kind of smaller mid-sized leaves. Um, and I I don't know if this is true or not, but I, I tend to think that it, it makes it easier to come back if I need to like a week or two later and harvest from the same bed again. Cool, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, something that um, I've been thinking about a lot as we've been doing spinach variety trials and visiting everyone's farms yeah, it's definitely harvest technique and the quality of, of spinach that it produces. And um, yeah, definitely if you're clear cutting, um, 
to harvest, yeah, you can't come back the next week yeah. <laughs> and get anything really. Um, so that's an awesome point. And my and my system kind of developed because I was um I had I I, still, I am but I'm not quite sure anymore. But I was limited in space, um, so where I had plenty of time. So I take pictures of the more labor intensive method because I had plenty of time but limited space to grow spinach in. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I think let's go on to the next farm and then we'll, if you keep on having questions, pop them in the chat and we can keep talking um, towards the end also. Okay, so there are two more questions and then John be able to take it on to them for the next. Sounds session. good. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. And I should say, I should have said this at the front, a huge thank you to Ryan and Danya and, and our other farm. Um, they they did a lot for this project and they put up with a, a lot of pestering questions from me um, <laughs> throughout the winter and then the summer trying to get all the data for this. Um, so much appreciated. All right, so the next farm that we'll look at, um, Farm 2, they wanted to remain anonymous, so you won't hear their name here, um, but they grow certified organic spinach and they market it mostly through wholesale accounts, 75% um, approximately through wholesale accounts and 25% through retail. Um, and they get a price of about 10.25 per pound, um, which was the highest price per pound of the three farms that we looked at. Um, they are definitely, uh, uh, they definitely use quite a bit of tractor work um, to prep the beds in their tunnels. Um, so that ends up being an equipment cost of about $55,000. Those are tractors and implements that are used across the farm um, on a variety of winter crops and a variety of summer crops. So all of that $55,000 can't be attributed to winter spinach because they just grow a small amount of winter spinach. Um, uh, and one of the biggest differences between Farm 2 and the other two farms that we looked at is that Farm 2 transplants their spinach um, with the goal of leaving their summer crops in the ground as late as possible um, and then shortening up that interval between planting into the tunnel and harvesting. So they, um, in early September, right about now, um, they would remove summer crops from the tunnel and seed spinach transplants in the greenhouse um, and then plant those transplants into the high tunnel in early October. Um, and this past winter, they were able to start harvesting um, on November 2nd, so just a month after planting into the tunnel. Um, and they were able, they had a harvest period that was about the same as at Many Hands, so about 20 weeks from November 2nd to March 22nd. Um, and then the other thing about planting at, on this farm was that they were doing a kind of trial within a case study, looking at comparing normal transplants to the paper pot system. Um, so their labor costs, the paper pot system is definitely a process that would save, um, save time and labor costs. Um, there, this year it includes, their labor time includes kind of a learning curve of learning how to use that system. Um, something to mention. But definitely the shortening of the interval between planting into the high tunnel and harvesting um, is something that a lot of farms are looking for, especially if you're trying to be able to harvest spinach. Um, maybe before Thanksgiving farmers markets or anything like that. Um, so this farm was able to achieve that. The other thing that was different about spinach production on this farm is that they use row cover on their spinach. Um, in their tunnel, you can see in the picture here, these, the two leftmost beds were spinach and then the rest of the beds were lettuce. Lettuce is definitely more cold sensitive than spinach and needs to be covered by row cover, um, at least on the, in the coldest times, otherwise it'll get damaged. Spinach is very cold tolerant, excuse me, um, and doesn't, it won't die in the cold, um, even if it gets frosted, as long as you don't touch the leaves while they're frosty, they won't be bothered. Um, but definitely in the darkest and coldest times of the winter, um, the light and the heat is definitely growth limiting for spinach. So you can use supplemental heat and or row cover to kind of push the spinach ahead. Um, and I, we haven't looked a lot at that process and how much you can push the growth ahead, um, but it is something that some growers do. You don't need to do it. They won't die without it, but um, uh, farm two also did get downy mildew in their tunnel. This is a picture 
um, of the symptoms, the, these yellow spots on the leaves correspond, um, laser pointer, these spots on the leaves <laughs> correspond to that gray fuzzy growth on the undersides of the leaves. So it started in late October, pretty early on in, in the season. And it was in one variety and then slowly by the end of the, uh, March, as you can see, it was in all three varieties that they were growing. Um, and using row cover definitely does increase humidity underneath. Downy mildew likes humidity. This farm totally might have gotten downy mildew even if they weren't using row cover, but it is a factor to think about. Um, an interesting thing about this farm is that, so they also harvest by hand with, with knives, but, but by hand, and they try and harvest the, the older leaves from around the outside of the plant. So you can see in this November 30th picture, this is after these plants have been harvested and the younger leaves are left in the center of the plants um, to grow kind of untouched. And so uh, on this farm, each little plant cluster, which was a transplant, is kind of treated as an individual cluster. Um, which is quite different from the, from the other farms. Um, and it did, uh, similarly to the cutworm damage at many hands, harvesting like that did let them kind of sort the leaves as they were harvesting and reject the leaves with downy mildew on them and keep unaffected leaves. So they were able to continue harvesting um, spinach through March, even though eventually it all had downy mildew. Um, it's not necessarily a practice that I would recommend because downy mildew can develop post-harvest like in the bag. Um, but this farm in this case was able to produce quite a bit of spinach um, despite having downy mildew, which was encouraging. Um, let's see, what else did I want to say about this farm? Um, this farm had a kind of middle of the road labor cost about 42 cents per square foot, um, which is understandable. They, they were um, the, the, the slightly increased mechanization makes sense for that, and they think they were harvesting um, uh, a bit faster. They did have a quite a high production materials cost at 77 cents per square foot. If you remember at many hands, it was about eight cents per square foot. Um, on farm two, their production materials included soil amendments. Um, they bought in quite a bit of compost to apply to the tunnel. Um, the row cover is an additional cost, although I assume it would also be used um, A, for multiple seasons, and B, on summer crops as well. Um, but then also transplant materials, transplant trays, potting mix, um, the, the paper pot um, trays are all additional costs there. So we don't have a representative from, from Farm 2, but if there's any um, questions that I might be able to answer, I'm happy to take a stab at them and pop them in the chat or unmute yourself, go right ahead. And again, we can come back to questions at the end also if you think of them. Maybe we'll do that. If you think of anything, pop it in the chat. So that brings us to the last farm that we'll talk about today, which is Queens Greens, also in Amherst, Mass. And Danya Teitelbaum uh, owns Queens Greens along with Matt Biscop, and Danya's on the line today. Um, so Queens Greens is quite different from the other two farms that we worked with. Um, they're quite a bit more mechanized than the other two farms, um, and Winter Greens um, are their specialty um, and so they, they put a lot of energy and focus on winter greens, um, which is spinach and some other crops as well. So they sell spinach um, mostly through wholesale accounts. Um, over the last winter, when we were doing this case study, they were growing certified organic spinach um, and they were getting a, a price per pound of about 9.75. Um, they, as I said, have some specialized equipment and are quite mechanized. So they have had an equipment cost of about $75,000. Um, and they do some tunnel prep that, that I think is also pretty unique because they're choosing to specialize in the winter greens. So over the summer of 2020, before this case study started, 
there was no cash crop in the tunnel um, and it was in cover crops instead, um, which is something that is definitely great for the soil and for soil health and for subsequently for crop health. It's really hard for most tunnel growers to justify doing it because it means not growing a cash crop in a tunnel for one summer and, and it's such a valuable space and you can make so much money off of high tunnel tomatoes or cucumbers or other stuff. Um, so it's definitely um, a difficult goal to uh, aspire to, but it, on this farm it's possible because their, their focus is the winter greens and not necessarily the summer crops. Um, so the tunnel was in cover crops um, and usually over the summer they would irrigate a lot um, in the late summer or early fall to flush salts that may have evaporated up um, to, the, to the surface of the soil to flush those salts back down into the soil profile. Um, but if, it's hard to remember at this point in the season when it's been so wet, but <laughs> summer 2020, there was, it was so dry. Um, and so this tunnel didn't get that flush of irrigation. Um, but prior to bed formation, um, they put down lime and gypsum and magnesium um, and then form beds, um, all using tractor implements. Um, and then they did irrigate to germinate a flush of weeds, which then get flamed to kill. Um, and then they spread fertilizer, in this case it was 606, um, spread fertilizer just prior to seeding. So they seed um, with a tractor mounted seeder. There's a picture of it here. Um, and they're able to get quite a dense seeding um, with that implement, they get about 140 plants per square foot, which is almost double um, double the density than at many hands. Um, oh, and I'm realizing as I say that, I forgot to mention something about transplanting at farm two, is that they had a significantly lower plant density. They were getting three plants per square foot um, with the transplanting. Forgot to mention that. But at Queen's Greens, this definitely ends up being a lawn of spinach as opposed to individual plants like at Farm 2. Um, and so they seeded originally at Queen's Greens on October 12th. They seeded Oroch, which is that variety that um, was grown on all three farms. Um, unfortunately, pretty soon after seeding in the tunnel, they found downy mildew on Oroch in a field right next to their high tunnels. Um, and because uh, spinach varieties are resistant to specific um, strains of spinach downy mildew, if there was downy mildew in the field auroch, that meant that the tunnel auroch was also susceptible to that downy mildew. So they decided to till in that auroch, which I think ended up being a good decision um, because as you'll see, there's a picture on the next slide. There was lots of auroch volunteers that weren't successfully killed um, and they did develop downy mildew over the course of the season. So I think that was a good decision. Um, and they reseeded uh, Colibri, which was the other variety they had on hand on October, around October 25th. Um, and they had their first harvest on January 24th. They harvested this tunnel twice, which is less than they would normally do. Um, so they harvested around January 24th and around mid-March. Um, and that was a span of, of about seven weeks. <clears throat> Um, and as someone asked about uh, yield and profit, so we're, we'll look at that all side by side with all three of the farms um, in a few slides. Um, but something interesting about Queens Greens was that uh, they had the highest plant density um, at 140 plants per square foot, but, uh, but I think it was the lowest yield per square foot. And that was primarily because, uh, unfortunately, they had a, a pretty significant, significant outbreak of Cladosporium leaf spot, which is a fungal disease. Um, and we see it mostly in winter tunnels. We don't, we don't see it much in the field. Um, it likes the cooler temperatures again. Um, so normally, and Danya can speak to this more specifically and tell me if I say anything wrong, Danya, but um, uh, normally they would harvest from a tunnel at least three times um, and this tunnel, the case study tunnel, only was harvested twice. Um, so assuming that they would have gotten at least another harvest out of that tunnel at about 950 pounds, um, conservative estimate there, 
that represents the effect of that cladosporium was at least like a $9,000 loss. And that, those are pretty conservative numbers. So that was a significant loss on this farm. Um, the other thing that I'll mention, which I think had a smaller effect, but still an effect is that they definitely harvest much smaller leaves at Queens Greens. Um, and I think maybe, Danya, you can jump in again, but uh, I think maybe you har they harvested slightly smaller again because of the cladosporium. Yeah. Um, is that true? Um, yeah, this, we're talking about like this, um, this tunnel, uh, maybe it's kind of interesting that way for a case study, but was our lowest, we had like um, 18 tunnels in spinach last winter. And this was the lowest yielding tunnel out of the 18 tunnels that we had. And uh, there were two main factors that contributed to that. One is it um, had the worst cladosporium outbreak of any of our tunnels. Some of our tunnels were cladosporium free um, that were different varieties. Uh, we had cladosporium across all of our colibri tunnels and this case study tunnel was the worst uh, affected. And um, the, I, I will say that, um, and these factors I think combine, but um, another reason this was a really low yielding tunnel was because um, we reseeded colibri so late. Um, normally colibri is actually a very slow growing variety for winter use. I like it in the winter as a winter spinach, but I normally wouldn't seed it past early October. It's very slow growing compared to auric. Um, October 12th is more of what I would think of as like a fast growing time slot. And then we like reseeded um, all the way October 25th with the colibri, um, just because it was literally the only spinach variety we had left that we knew was resistant to the downy mildew strain um, on hand. And so I think that it had the worst, my guess is it had the worst Cladosporium outbreak because it was so like young and weak and slow growing compared to the others that were like very robust at that stage. And we also like January 24th is a very late first harvest for our tunnels, which also contributed to it like eventually, you know, being lower yielding. So um, it was a notably unsuccessful tunnel compared to some <laughs> others, which is kind of interesting, but. <laughs> I'm sure as soon as we made the decision to choose this specific tunnel as the case study tunnel, it was destined to be <laughs> the outlier for the whole season, <laughs> as always. But okay, that's good uh, insights to have there. Uh, um, I am, the, the last point I have about Queen's Greens is not surprising in the slightest. Um, obviously, uh, you guys have, specialized equipment that's expensive, but then that corresponds to very low labor costs. Um, so I think the labor costs worked out to being five cents per square foot um, compared to on farm two it was 40 something cents per square foot. And at many hands it was one, 130, something like that per square foot. So that's not surprising. That's like the definition of <laughs> increasing mechanization on a farm, um, but you gotta say it out loud there. Um, does anyone have any questions for Danya while we're, while we're all here? And again, we can come back to questions. Go ahead and jump in or pop anything into the chat. And I can no longer see your face. So just if there's no questions, let me know and we'll, uh, we can come back and people can keep on popping them in. Yeah, there's nothing there right now. There's still a couple left over from the first farm, but I figure we'll get to that in the air. Cool, sounds good. But yeah, nothing for Queen. Okay, as things keep percolating through, pop questions in the chat or jump in, anyone. Cool. So we just talked about all the farms individually. Um, and this slide is kind of all three farms, um, one next to another. Um, and they're, um, and in, this, in, this includes uh, yield values from each of the farms sales values, um, and then profit per square foot. And again, I'll say the, all of these numbers um, the equipment cost and then the profit also don't include um, 
they don't include any of the equipment costs actually. So um, this profit per square foot, uh, it, it ends up getting very complicated to, <laughs> to kind of tie in equipment costs that are, if the equipment is shared across many different crops, across different seasons and everything. Um, and I definitely am not an economist. <laughs> so the profit per square foot doesn't take into, into account any equipment costs. Um, and then also the whole case study didn't take into account any post-harvest um, equipment or labor or materials or anything like that. So that's just a disclaimer there. Um, but there were some things that were not surprising and some things that were kind of surprising um, about, about all these farms. So we'll kind of go through this uh, line by line. Um, obviously, I've said this a few times, the equipment costs on all three farms were not uh, surprising. Um, it's much cheaper to not have specialized equipment and it's much more expensive to have specialized equipment. Um, the thing that, again, I already mentioned this, but um, the thing that surprised me about the plant density, so going from this very low plant density on farm two that was transplanting to kind of medium range at, at many hands and very high plant density at green screens is that plant density definitely affects the method that you can use to harvest. So if you want to be harvesting leaf by leaf and being able to select like that, if you have a super dense lawn of spinach, it's not really possible to harvest leaf by leaf. Um, and similarly, if you're going to be clear cutting um, like they do at Queen's Greens, um, it, in my mind, it makes sense to yeah plant as densely as you can um, if you don't need to be selecting individual leaves. Um, so in both directions, plant density affects your harvest method and your harvest method can inform your plant density in that way. Um, and then because labor is so connected to equipment, um, the labor time and cost on the farms was not uh, really surprising. Uh, Queen's Greens that has uh, only needs one person to seed and two people to harvest for an hour each um, have very low uh, labor costs. And at many hands where it was Ryan doing most of the work um, by himself, uh, obviously had um, much, uh, much higher labor time per square foot. <clears throat> um, production materials costs were significantly higher on farm two, 77 cents per square foot compared to five and eight cents per square foot. Um, and I already said this, but I'll say it again, that I, I mostly think about the effect of transplanting being that you have, you can't plant as densely and it's gonna be a, a labor, additional labor to transplant and seed. Um, and then you're going to have lower density. But I didn't really think about the fact that obviously transplanting also increases production material costs with the with the trays and the potting mix and the greenhouse space. <clears throat> Sylvia? Yeah. Um, are we looking at the right slide? Or the, are we still supposed to be looking at the farm three slide for Queens? Oh, no. Can, is everyone seeing farm three? We're only all seeing. Yeah, there's been people in the chat saying. Yeah. Let me. Uh, let me close and reshare here. Yeah. I was clicking my way through. <laughs> Happy as a clam. Okay, do you see the side by side slide now? No, nope. still just three. Let me stop sharing. If I can figure out how to. Bear with me. Hmm. Hey, Lisa. Yeah. I my Zoom is not letting me do things, so okay. I'm gonna leave and rejoin in as okay. one, one minute. I think you or Hannah will bounce to being the host. Great. Sorry, folks. Somebody did just put in the chat, what varieties will everyone plant for this winter? So if, if uh, while Jean-Bierre is straightening out our technical difficulties, if we wanna have a little uh, freeform chat, people can feel free to unmute themselves and talk about what they're planning to grow. Well, I liked I liked Oric, um, but I generally have been trying to just follow recommendations and get used to the idea that um, 
I have to change change varieties um, because of the d- different disease pressures and such. So I tend to be um, I tend to try to be flexible and, and just use what's recommended that year. Yeah, it seems like a good approach to being whatever is is um, yeah recommended in terms of disease resistance and then also what's available. I think that that's also <laughs> going to have to inform your decisions is what you can get. Tanya, did you have thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I guess in a somewhat similar vein to what Ryan just said, um, I try to stay really flexible on it. Um, and keep on top of what new varieties are out there that are most resistant. Um, Additionally, I try to grow a lot of varieties because I fully, it's a massive amount of disease pressure in the winter. And I do know our growing system of dense plants even, you know, increases that. And, um, but the, um, so, I, I expect potentially to have downy mildew in certain varieties, to have cladosporium in certain varieties, like as things unfold. So um, I, think, I think this winter we're planning to plant 13 different varieties in the tunnels because um, I just feel like that is the best um, assurance that we can have in terms of if one variety ends up getting diseased pretty badly, it will only be a relatively small percentage of our total crop. <clears throat> yeah, it's one of the sort of interesting, if there is an advantage to there being all these different strains of the pathogen, particularly downy mildew, then um, having different options for which varieties to grow is definitely one of the upshots. Yeah, absolutely. Jambiab, are you back on? I'm back. Can you see the side-by-side slide now? And this was the slide that was right after the Farm 3 slide we were stuck on? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Or, actually, I don't know that. if you saw that last one. Flip back to the last slide. Did yeah, you see that one? Yeah, I think we actually missed it. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Well, I guess you heard the things that I said on this slide, but um, uh, the pictures you missed. So there's pictures of the tunnel, and then this is um, the mechanical harvester at Queen's Greens, and this is the view from the back of it. Um, yeah. And I caught the tail end of that variety discussion and Danya said about three of the take home messages that we're gonna get to. So right on Danya. Okay, so this is the slide that you guys couldn't see that um, would be really not fun to just listen to. Um, But so this table shows each of the farms side by side um, with uh, the most of the same parameters listed down the side here. Um, but it does show yield from each of the tunnels, both total yield, um, and then the tunnels were different sizes. They're listed up here at up top, um, but everything is broken down per square foot also. So it has yield and sales and then profit per square foot. And this was the line, the bottom line, the profit one, um, that uh, doesn't include equipment costs and doesn't include any post-harvest anything. And this is something that I will send out um, this table, at least to everyone afterwards, um, because it's a little bit to digest. Um, So I was saying equipment costs were not surprising. Plant density, um, you can see the range here, the very low plant density, medium, and then very high at clean screens, um, and that it definitely affects potential harvest methods. Labor time and labor cost, um, because they're so connected to equipment costs, was not not super surprising. Um, and then you can see the significantly higher production materials costs at farm two because of the transplanting and the um, compost and all that stuff compared to many hands in Queens Greens, which were very low. And then one of the things that just strikes us again and again is that we don't seem to have reached the cap of what <laughs> customers will pay for for winter greens, um, at least this this past winter might have been um, exceptional in that way, also because of COVID, um, and it depends on your market as well. But um, obviously, it doesn't. I don't even really need to say it. But if you just increase your price per pound, you'll make more profits, obviously. Um, and so it does make sense that um, that many hands that 
that Ryan is getting a significantly lower price per pound because it's through a CSA. Um, and you don't want your CSA members to feel like you're you're robbing them <laughs> and charging 1025 per pound for, sp for spinach through a CSA. Um, but vice versa, also, you don't want your, your CSA customers to be eating you dry um, of spinach. Um, and then because of all of the, the, the cladosporium issues at at Queen's Greens this year, the yield, um, uh, yeah, the yield and sales numbers were were surprising this year with with our um, least densely planted um, farm two being the most profitable or the most um, yeah the most high yielding farm of these three, um, and part of that um, is because they are selling for a very high price per pound. Definitely another factor is that if that Queen's Greens um, if that tunnel had been producing normally for the year, if there had been no cladosporium, that would have bumped, bumped up their yield and sales numbers quite a bit. Um, but it's, it's interesting to think about there. Um, so I don't have any questions there. It, it's a little bit to digest, but feel free to jump in. Because the last thing that we'll talk about is some kind of broader picture take home messages of potentially ways to, to increase yield or profitability that don't necessarily have to do with these case studies. But if not, we will go ahead and talk about them and keep on popping things into the chat. It does look like Zambia, there's a question about Corvair, the variety. Someone wants to know which variety replaces it. I'm assuming that if there's a disease issue that it's not. Can you say that again? There's Corvair and they're wondering. They asked what variety replaces Corvair. Oh, is Corvair not available anymore? Or are they is whoever asked that question, you're welcome to unmute. Um, I'm wondering if you are just looking for an alternative to Corvair um, for a specific reason or, or more generally. I, I can say broadly that um, that we have been doing spinach, winter spinach high tunnel variety trials for the past few years. Um, and there are so many spinach varieties, we can't possibly trial them all. Um, but I, I can, I'm gonna go to the next slide here because one of our take home messages is as Dania said, to grow multiple any mildew resistant varieties. Um, and uh, downy mildew, I'm skipping ahead here. Downy mildew resistance is, um, is presented in seed catalogs like this. Um, so these are the races, one through 11, 13, 13, 15, 16. Those are the races that this particular variety is resistant to. Um, so the varieties with the broadest resistance possible are, are a, a great choice. Um, and then if you're growing multiple varieties that you wanna make sure that they have um, they don't have overlapping gaps. So you don't want to grow three varieties that are all susceptible to race 12, because then if race 12 blows in, then still all of your spinach will go down. But if this one is susceptible to race 12, race 14, uh, and 17 through 19, and you have another variety that complements that, um, that's a good, good move. And something that I can send out to everyone, um, I'll send an email after, after we're done today, um, with again, the Excel sheet that has the um, enterprise budgets. Um, and then also our reports from our, our variety trials that have some recommendations for varieties and lots of pictures of varieties. Um, so I'll include that information about varieties in an email. Um, but so other things that, that you could think about to potentially improve increase yield and improve profitability of your winter spinach. Um, we've been talking about this all throughout the hour, but planting more densely um, can definitely increase your, your yield if you have more plants, um, especially if you're open to clear cutting the spinach to harvest. Um, and, uh, and that just depends on your customers and what they'll accept, um, if they'll accept. So sometimes when you clear cut the regrowth, the leaves will be kind of cut looking. Um, and it depends on what 
if your customers are, are willing to accept um, accept that. We have found in our spinach trials in, in high tunnels that some varieties show those cut leaves or show that cutting more than others. So in these two pictures over here, Responder was a variety that we trialed last year. Um, and both of these pictures here are after two harvests. Um, so this was in late March. Um, and Responder you, it barely looked like it had been harvested ever. Um, there was very few cut leaves in there. Um, and it looked almost like you were harvesting it for the first time. Um, by comparison, Bandicoot over here also had been harvested twice. Um, and I don't know if you can see, I don't know how big the picture is on all of your screens, um, but there's, you, you can see quite a few cut leaves in there and it was looking pretty raggedy by the, by the this was gonna be the third harvest in this picture. Um, so again, in one of the reports that I'll send out after this, um, there's pictures of all the varieties that we trialed and you can see pretty clearly which ones um, were kind of uncut after a few harvests and which ones were looking pretty cut. Um, and definitely it, it, from what I, from what I've seen of the markets out there, it, it seems like in the winter, people are just so hungry for greens that um, you don't necessarily need to be producing the highest quality greens around. <laughs> a few cut leaves is, seems acceptable from what I've seen. Um, and then obviously this, the next point here is, is a low hanging fruit, but if you charge more, then you um, make more money, theoretically. Um, and especially if you're, uh, lost my train of thought on that one. It's okay. If you increase your price per pound, you can make more money. Um, and then, uh, uh, I, be, I think I mentioned this at the beginning um, of the hour, but uh, if, you're, if you're harvesting very little leaves and you can let them grow a little bit bigger, to, again, depending on your market, depending on your harvesting methods and all of that, um, it, do, it could potentially bump up your yields just a little bit. Um, like Ryan was saying, if you suddenly grow a variety that grows much faster than you're used to and you suddenly just have bigger leaves, if your customers will accept it, um, maybe it's a good thing. Um, another thing that people ask about a lot is, is about row cover and whether or not you need to use it. So I said this when we were talking about farm two, but the plants won't die, spinach plants won't die without row cover, they, they will be fine. They might not grow super fast through January and beginning of February, um, but they won't die. Um, so it's something to think about whether you want to try and push along the growth a little bit using row cover um, or supplemental heat. Um, or if you want to spend less time on labor and, and the row cover um, and just ride out the, the slow growth of the winter. Um, and then yes, growing multiple downy mildew resistant varieties. And I, I said downy mildew resistant varieties, but as Danya pointed out, um, yeah, the cladosporium um, is a whole other disease. So just growing multiple varieties in general will, will uh, protect your back if, if something the disease shows up and hopefully there's some varietal difference um, in susceptibility. And then the last thing that I'll mention is fertility. Um, so it's not super well known how available nutrients are in the cold high tunnel soil. Um, and then everyone's summer production in their high tunnels is different. Um, and fertility in your summer high tunnel crops is, is, is quite variable. Um, so the nutrients that are in the soil and available for a winter spinach crop or a winter greens crop can vary widely based on how much nutrients are left over from a summer crop. Um, but it's pretty common to see something like this in the um, in like late February getting into March um, when suddenly the plants are growing more quickly again and they used up all the nitrogen that was there in the fall and there's not really not much left. Um, so we we do recommend adding some fertilizer up front. And then what we've been doing in our variety trials, and it seems it's a pretty feasible process, is to take a PSNT, a, a pre-side dress nitrate test, um, in late February when the plants are starting to kind of take off again. Um, and, and let that test inform whether you need to side dress. Um, and the recommendation is to side dress with some nitrogen if nitrate is below 30 parts per million. Um, and then I put our 
the, the nutrient rates that we've been using down here, 20 pounds per acre of nitrogen, 20 to 40 pounds per acre of phosphorus, and 25 to 55 pounds per acre of potassium. Um, again, it's not there. The, uh, Cornell is currently doing some research looking at um, looking at optimal winter spinach fertility um, and the differences between um, organic forms of organic and non-organic forms of, of nitrogen and whether that makes a difference. So it'll be interesting to see what they um, what they come up with. And then the last thing uh, that we'll go through, I think we're getting, ooh, 12.59, we're gonna squeak in here right before in one. Um, we, so this is a SARE project, all this work was funded by SARE and we have another year of the grant um, going forward. So our next, um, our next step in the grant is we're gonna be looking at germination and damping off issues um, this coming winter. So uh, damping off um, is, cause, is a disease caused by several soil dwelling fungi um, and fungal like organisms that can kill seeds before they germinate um, or kill seeds right after they germinate, um, leading to like patchy stand and poor germination. Um, so we are going to do a trial in, in our research high tunnel at EMS, um, looking at two different factors in combination and alone. Um, we're going to try priming spinach seed, which is soaking it in water before seeding um, to try and speed up germination uh, with the idea that the faster the, the plants are growing, the less susceptible they'll be to these um, damping off pathogens. The damping off pathogens tend to be um, not super strong pathogens, so they tend to take advantage of like weak, slow growing plants when the soil is cold and the plants are kind of creeping along. So we're looking at priming the seed and then we're also looking at incorporating cover crop residue into the soil um, with the idea of feeding the, the soil microbes and giving the beneficial microbes a, a leg up against those pathogens, which are always kind of poor competitors in the soil. Um, so keep your ears peeled for, for things about that next spring. Um, which seems far away next spring, but soon enough, it's gonna look like this. Wonderful wintry high tunnel photo here. Um, and then the next thing is that we are, as part of this project, we're looking for spinach growers, winter spinach growers, who are interested in making a change in their spinach production um, and then monitoring the effects and, and keeping us posted about the effects. Um, so um, Hannah is gonna run a poll right now. It's optional. And it's just asking you if that's something that you're interested in, um, it would be just saying yes. And then we would give you some resources, some time tracking resources some yield tracking resources. Um, and then we'd stay in touch with you over this next winter um, and ask for some feedback from you in the spring. Um, so if you say yes, then I have all your emails from the Zoom registration and I'll get in touch in the next week. Um, and we can brainstorm about some changes to make, or you might have ideas already by yourself, um, and that'll be great. Um, and once again, I wanna say a huge thank you to Ryan and Danya and to our other farm. Um, they put up with a lot of pestering from me for numbers and <laughs> information this, this year, and I appreciate it a lot. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, uh, as always with grant funded work, we have we always have to prove that we're being effective. So um, we have a very short evaluation for you guys to fill out just whether or not you learned anything. Um, and Hannah's gonna stick the link to that evaluation in the chat um, and I'll email it out to you. We always are very appreciative of you guys letting us know how we're doing and if you have any feedback for us. So that is what I've got, maybe, um, if there's any other questions, or Hannah, if we want to go back to those few questions for Ryan. Yeah, yeah we've got two questions for Ryan and one for Danya. The ones for Ryan, if somebody wanted to know if there's a heat source in the tunnel. You're breaking up a bit. I don't know if you're breaking oh. up for other people. Let me see. Can you hear me now? I can also just take my headphones off. Um, is this better? That's better. Okay, great. Um, someone wanted to know if there's a heat source. Oh, Hello? Hey, Ryan. Hey, Ryan. I think the question is, do you have a heat source in your tunnel? Yeah. Do you have a heat source in the green? No, no. Yeah, all the tunnels in this in the project were unheated. Cool. 
And then again, yeah, similar to the row cover, uh, supplemental heat is definitely not like it, the spinach won't die if there's no supplemental heat, um, but it can definitely push um, the growth along a little bit during the cold, dark portion of the winter. I actually I had a question about row cover. Yeah. Um, and the spinach. Uh, does it have to be kept off of the spinach? Like if it's if it does get down to freezing and the row cover is there, does that increase the likelihood of the spinach leaves getting getting the damage from being touched while frozen? I did see a little bit of that in the tunnel uh, that was using row cover. It wasn't like crazy extensive. Um, so I don't mm -hmm. know any more than that. It's a good question. Definitely it wants to be, this is not really an answer to that question, but it definitely should be removed during the day on like a warm, sunny day um, to get that heat mm -hmm. out of there um, and to let more light in and everything. So that's where the labor comes in is like putting it on and taking it off and putting it on and taking it off as with all row cover. <laughs> And there are actually two more general questions too. Uh, one was someone asked whether BT works on winter cutworm. Whether BT works on winter cutworm. Uh, that I have to look into. I don't know off the top of my head. I It should being a caterpillar. So BT um, is a gut toxin. So it needs to be, it's targeted towards caterpillars and it needs to be ingested. I have a feeling though that we had this discussion amongst New England extension people and there was some details about people who had experience with it so I would have to look that up and if whoever asked that wants to shoot me an email then I can respond directly to them. Okay and then someone else asked about ventilation. Ventilation what? Uh, recommendation. Definitely ventilation well you in the winter winter you don't want to lose all of your heat but the more airflow to dry off the leaves and reduce humidity, the better. I don't know, Danya, if you have any uh, pointers about what you do at, on your farm. Um, yeah, well, we try to, um, all of our spinach tunnels are off grid, so we don't have any fans or anything that's like actively moving air through the tunnels. Um, so we have just passive venting, like we just have vents that we just manually have open. Um, and we just, uh, we try to keep them open. We try to keep some vents open all winter in all of the spinach tunnels um, because venting, ventilation is extremely important. Um, I think different, different farms are always like struggling with different things, but like for us over the years, um, I have become, I don't know, this is, uh, we're going to, We've done winter spinach for 12 winters um, in off-grid tunnels, and I have become increasingly not concerned about the spinach getting cold um, and increasingly concerned about having uh, disease prevention as much as possible and like the ventilation, just keeping the leaves dry, getting air moving, um, getting those tunnels to dry out uh, as much as possible. Um, we see it having a big effect and I like, you know, uh, it has to be ex like, in an unusual cold snap for us to actually close all of the ventilation down in the tunnels. Um, so we try to keep at least some open all the time. Cool. Yeah, all I think all of the tunnels that we were working with at various times in the winter would have, yeah, sides up, doors open. Because on the hot days, uh, yeah, I think it's also stressful for the plants to be like, Sometimes it's like 80 degrees in the tunnel on a hot day that's not too cold and then suddenly and then it gets super cold at night and it's better to have even temperature, I think, as much as possible. Yeah. And because we have a lot of tunnels and the ventilation is like manual, like we're actually having to like, uh, we have uh, vents at the top, our peak, peak vents at, at each end wall that we act, which is what we try to keep open all winter. And to close them and open them, we actually have to get on a ladder and wiggle wire plastic over them, take it down, that we really just try to keep them, we do that as little as possible. It has to be, we have a, you know, we have in total 50 vents on, on our farm. So it's a huge project to change our ventilation. And we just really just try to keep it open all the time, even so they're open at night also in the winter. Cool, thanks, Tanya. Ryan, if you have anything to add to that, jump, jump on in. 
Uh, no, nothing out of the ventilation. I uh, I probably have the least, the worst. Um, I'm probably the worst at cover, like keeping all the like, sealing up my greenhouses. So kind of the like, it's not it's not out of um, any intention um, to like avoid diseases. But uh, it's like yeah, I haven't been. Um, I see some people make a lot of extreme effort to to close up their greenhouses um, to avoid cold temperatures and uh, for, for like. You know, for my winter spinach, especially, it's 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 not it hasn't been much of a concern for me, and I haven't I don't I haven't felt hurt by it either. Yeah, it's a hardy crop. Spinach is yeah, it likes it cold, and it's. Although I would I would say my um, letting my leaves get as big as I did, I wish I'd harvested more of them early, um, because they were so big, and also like a note that I just like I got some cheap plastic that would drip condensation down on the leaves. Um, and I think I, I definitely where I had the beds I'd left for last to harvest that I'd saved for like January um, were had suffered a lot of um, of cold damage because I think I think things were rustling through the leaves while they were frozen like rodents or or just like dripping from above. Ah, interesting. That's good. And I think it was also leaf leaf size was all like the plant size was also a factor like the. Um, I always feel like the smaller leaves are, are more resistant to, to damage from cold. Ah, interesting. I hadn't thought about that as a factor. I wonder. Cool. Yeah, We're I think it might just be like a, like there's less, there's less area to get damaged or that like the leaves are less likely to be like touching each other all in each other's space or whatever. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Cool. I had never paid attention to that, but now I will. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, we are at 1.10. Um, were there any other uh, pressing questions in the chat, Hannah? There was one quick question for Danya about what spinach variety she plans planting this fall. Um, that's the last question question. And then there's one question, so I'll, but before we get to that, it seemed important somebody asked about how to access the recording. Ah. Yeah, so, um, uh, uh, let's see, I didn't ask Danya and Ryan ahead of time if it was <laughs> okay to record and post this, so I'll check in with you guys afterwards to just make sure if it's okay to post. But if it's okay to post, then I will send out the recording to everyone who's registered. So if you're here, then you'll get a link in your email list if we will be posting it. Cool. And then, yeah, Danya, what varieties are you going to be growing this year? Right. We are going to be growing... Um... Colibri, Renegade, Space, Sun Angel. I'm gonna like try to remember them all here. <laughs> Crosstrek, Padden, Hammerhead, Auric, Gazelle, uh, Tundra, Acadia. And I think that's it. <laughs> oh, wow. um, and that's not like, uh, you know, um, our, our, as I said, some of those varieties, if you were to look in like a seed catalog or talk to other people, I, this is my disclaimer here, are like not necessarily recommended winter varieties. Um, some of them are. Uh, our goal is really just like to grow more varieties. And even if, we're, even if a handful of those varieties are slightly uh, not necessarily the top recommendation by um because uh, i just rather have more out there um but a, a, a lot of those are really good winter varieties i would say tundra and acadia are not great winter varieties they're slow they're not really considered winter varieties um but they have a but we are we are planning to grow them for the winter to just increase our variety i think probably also renegade is like not the greatest winter variety but um uh but it might have, like, even if it's slower growing than a winter variety, um, it might have those, if, you know, they're more summertime varieties, so they generally, it, they might have more Cladosporium resistance or more other things that end up being beneficial besides just really fast growth for us. Cool. Yeah, in our trial last year, Crosscheck and Patton were both beautiful um, and did well in the winter, so... <laughs> And I'll say it can be kind of tricky. To, a lot of the, the I'll send out our variety trial results, and a lot of them are not always available through like Johnny's or High Mowing or Northeast Distributors. So something we sometimes recommend is like banding together <laughs> with your neighbor farms or 
or with yeah other farmers to try and get a bulk order that you can special order through um, one of the seed distributors because it can be a bit tricky to to get. 